Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to all. I am very happy we, we have today the second uh, webinar, the second episodes of this webinar series. We have decided to dedicate to uh, some main issues related to the present outbreak and uh, reading uh, all these issues in a global health perspective and uh, through the lenses uh, and uh, the, the powerful, I think, uh, the relevant instruments uh, ethics uh, can offer us, considering also what uh, technology can, uh, can do at present, uh, when the, the scenarios to face are very challenging. For this episode, uh, we have uh, four distinguished guests. I thank uh, uh, every one of you for, uh, for accepting to join us. Uh, Rosamund Rhodes, uh, the two speakers are Rosamund Rhodes, who is a professor of medical education and director of bioethics education at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. She is also professor of philosophy at the City University of New York. And uh, Rosamund, I think she is like a mother of bioethics. Sometimes some colleague in the state says there are the the founding fathers, there are also the founding mothers. I think Rosamond represents a, a very relevant uh, um, thinker and bioethicist. She has extensively written on bioethics issues and uh, a couple of books I wish to quote are Medicine and Social Justice, um, who was edited in the in the 2002 with a second edition in 2012, a book on physician assisted suicide and uh, the most recent book, uh, I think it, it, could, uh, um, it could be a, a very good book to read also at present, uh, um, has uh, this title, The Trusted Doctor, Medical Ethics and Professionalism. The book came out past the spring. Uh, Rosamond is currently working on a new book, so she is working uh, to, to improve our understanding of bioethics. And uh, um, we will listen to her presentation as first speaker. Our second speaker, and we thank her for coming and joining us. Our second speaker is Joseph Rao. Joe is a, a, a philosopher, a clinical ethicist at present. He works uh, at the University of California, Los Angeles, in Los Angeles, and uh, is also uh, a member of the faculty at the Bioethics Institute of Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. Joseph uh, has worked in the past for the President's Council on Bioethics in the States uh, and spent uh, around three, I think, for three or four years in Italy for his PhD program that he uh, held in, uh, at the University of Pisa. And after the PhD in philosophy in Italy, he completed his training as a clinical ethicist at, uh, at the University of California, Los Angeles. So thank you, Joe, for, for joining us. The discussion today is Jenny Clark Schiff. Uh, Jenny is a, currently a PhD student in philosophy at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. She serves also as an ethics fellow at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Uh, she works on bioethics, uh, philosophy of medicine, logic, history of logic, and philosophy of sport. That is something peculiar, actually. Uh, she received a BA in philosophy at Columbia College and spent uh, uh, two years uh, in Italy uh, to study Italian in, in, in relationship with uh, an MA in Italian literature she received from Columbia University. So 
also Jenny has some Italian connections, good Italian connections. Um, Stefano Semplici will be our chair. I thank him again for accepting to, to chair this uh, webinar today. Stefano is professor of social ethics and bioethics at Tor Vergata University in Rome. He was appointed as chair of the International Bioethics Committee of the UNESCO from 2011 till 2015. And he serves also in the uh, Committee of Bioethics of the Italian Society of Pediatrics. Um, Stefano uh, is actually a corresponding member of the Pontifical Academy for Life. So I thank all of you for coming, for joining us. I leave uh, the floor now to Stefano, who will chair the rest of the session. I, I ask you uh, simply to uh, a little, uh, I have a little request for you. Uh, I ask all the participants to turn off microphone and cameras to allow the registration of this uh, episode. And uh, I would like to thank right now three people, sorry for doing that right now, but I think it's better than at the end, who are uh, Michele Nicoletti. Uh, Michele is, uh, we are co-organizing this webinar series with Michele. Jerome Bitosam, who spent uh, his, uh, his he past year here in Trento and he contributed to think of this series. And thank you, Jerome, for joining us uh, from Cameroon. And Monica Consolandi, who is our colleague and, and uh, she works with us at the Center uh, for uh, Religious Studies at the Fondazione Bruno Kessler. And uh, thank, thanks to Monica, we, we could invite Rosamond and Jenny. So I think uh, there are all these exchanges that help us uh, to keep uh, a global perspective on the issues we will discuss uh, today. So thank you so much. Uh, all of you and everybody, and let's start uh, uh, our session. Thank you. Thank you, Lucia, for introducing our speakers, the discussant and me. Uh, just let me uh, a very short preliminary uh, observation. Uh, the topic we are going to address uh, is not relevant only for uh, uh, what we are used to call disaster medicine situations. Uh, it is about resources, and resources is a burning issue for everyday medicine uh, as well, when uh, it is about ensuring uh, that everyone can have access to the treatment they need, uh, not uh, simply uh, the, the treatment they, they could afford, the treatment they have the ability to pay. So in uh, medicine and uh, ethics concerning medicine in uh, uh, global bioethics uh, is always uh, about resources. Needless to say, uh, the topic uh, becomes all the more relevant when uh, it is about uh, a situation like uh, uh, the one we are living, uh, that is the outbreak of a pandemic, uh, when uh, the case may be uh, that uh, uh, allocation of scarce resources directly and immediately impinge upon the possibility itself to uh, have uh, uh, resources available for uh, everyone uh, whose life is uh, directly, immediately uh, jeopardized when it comes to tragic uh, decisions uh, concerning triage, uh, when it comes about the shortage uh, of beds uh, in intensive care units. So uh, the issue of justice and uh, equity uh, is really on the front line of our ethical, uh, maybe even political uh, responsibility about what uh, uh, we owe each other. So uh, thank you again for uh, being with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, Rosamund is our first speaker. Rosamund, the floor is yours. Oh, thank don't you. please remember that you are supposed to have uh, 20, 25 minutes available for each presentation. Uh, thank you for uh, 
also for for uh, for that. Rosamund, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. So here we begin. First, thank you, Lucia. Thank you, Lucia. Thank you, Stefano. Thank you, everyone in Trento for inviting me. And I'm delighted to share my thoughts with you. Prepare yourself. Um, I'm probably, you'll probably think that I'm speaking heresy. Okay, so I'll blame this heresy on Aristotle. So there are different people have different views of what justice involves. And Aristotle devoted a lot of attention to explaining justice. And I learned from him. So Aristotle acknowledged the complexity and contextuality of justice. Um, Aristotle talks about, we start with what is known to us. So Aristotle believes in starting with the facts that you can see in the world. And this is in opposition to Plato, who believes you start with uh, the light you see at the end of the tunnel. Um, so among the things that Aristotle considers relevant are the history of relationships, um, the kinds of relationships, consequences, feasibility, lots of particulars about the situation. But his general rule about justice is that justice involves giving each person what is due him and treating similarly situated individuals similarly. So in general, his theory of ethics is about doing what is right and Justice is doing what is right with respect to your fellow human being. And this complex view means that justice requires moral discernment. You have to look at the situation and make decisions that are relevant to the situation. In other words, we start with what is known to us. And with that, we identify which factors are significant, we determine how they should be compared and identify the principles for, for guiding our decisions. Now, in everyday justice, we actually use a lot of different principles of justice. If you're going to buy a slice of pizza, you want to get not a smaller one than the fellow before you got, or a bigger one than the person behind you will get. You want an equal share. If you're playing the game Monopoly, everybody starts with the same amount of money. So equal shares is a very good principle of justice in some circumstances. Um, in the United States, if you're going to a, a movie, we're not doing it right now, but if you go to a movie theater soon, um, they give out tickets based on first come, first serve. Sometimes we allocate resources based on need, but sometimes we think about who deserves it most. If you're giving out Nobel Prizes, you're going to look at people's past performance and out decide who should get the prize. But if you're picking people for the Olympic team, you're going to think about who will contribute the most in the future. Or if you're allocating research grants, who's going to contribute the most in the future? So we have a whole list of different kinds of principles of justice that we use for different allocations. If you're having a had a holiday dinner for Easter, you will invite your nearest and your dearest, your loved ones, that's fine, but it's not the same principle we use for other allocations. In responding to an article by Norman Daniels, philosopher Ronald Green points out the mistake that a lot of people make when thinking about justice. He said, the mistake is trying to decide such matters by reference to a single consideration and not necessarily the most important one. So a lot of people, some people think that justice is utility, utilitarians, or justice is priority for the worst off, or justice is fair equality of opportunity, or justice is reciprocity. So my first conclusion is that 
we have to acknowledge that there are several principles of justice that have a legitimate place in resource allocation. And justice requires that allocations focus on a specific practical problem, what is known, identify the principles that address broadly supported and compelling concerns. Now, when it comes to medicine, medical professionals are given the power and authority to allocate medical resources. They're given this tremendous amount of resources and we all trust them to identify the principles that should be used in making those allocations. So we start by asking which principles of justice are compatible with society's trust for allocating limited resources. And you try to figure out in this particular situation, which principles should we use? And then you ignore other principles that are irrelevant for this particular allocation decision. In other words, you're triaging your principles. You're excluding those principles that are inappropriate for making these decisions. In other words, you're making appropriate discriminations. You're deciding which factors are relevant, which factors should not influence the decision, and then you make the decisions as rigorously and practicably as you can. So if you think back a minute ago, I gave you a long list of different kinds of principles of allocation that we use. And then if you think about making medical decisions, some of these concepts are inappropriate for making medical decisions. So if you think of the emergency room, first come first serve sometimes works when everybody's there with a splinter or a sprained ankle. But if somebody ha is having a stroke or a heart attack, they should come first. So we don't always use first come first serve. We should always also not pick like a lottery, choose who comes first, but we consider things like urgency and need. Um, we don't make discriminations based on who deserves it more. The Nobel laureate with a splinter or a sprained ankle shouldn't come before the terrorist bomber who's bleeding out. Um, certainly not my nearest or my dearest. So there are some principles of everyday ethics that are inappropriate, not acceptable in making me medical decisions. Oops. something went wrong. So here's a list of some of the principles of medical justice that I think are very appropriate, but there will be different circumstances for making different decisions. So we have a whole list and it's not exactly the same as the list we use for everyday decisions. And in different domains of medicine, we're going to rely on different principles. So for example, um, what I'm calling domiciliary care, people in a nursing home or a hospice, we're recognizing that they can't be cured, that they are there for a long time or for a short time until they die. So in that case, domiciliary care, we're going to focus on what promotes people's well-being and equality but not things like urgency or utility. Just keep everybody comfortable and keep them clean. In this COVID situation, we're talking about critically scarce resources, the one in orange at the bottom. When we expect that we do not have enough resources for everyone, that some people will not get the resources that they need. And there, we typically use the principle of avoid the worst outcome and urgency. And then this column on the right is equality. Everybody gets treated based on avoiding the worst outcome and how urgent their situation is, and nothing else should matter. 
that nothing else should matter is the important part. So my second conclusion is that it's difficult to achieve justice in medicine and public health, again, because there is no single governing principle and no simple formula for success. A variety of considerations can and do legitimately support good policy, and policies must reflect the choices that inform people cannot reasonably reject the priorities that informed reasonable people can recognize as the most pressing concerns in the situation. So here you should hear echoes of Tim Scanlon and John Rawls. So triage in the hospital. So this is clinical ethics. And in the hospital, when we recognize that we don't have enough resources or will not have enough resources for treating everyone who needs them, we have to make some rules. And my question is, should triage be implemented in the clinical setting? So triage is avoid the worst outcome. So this idea about triage comes to us from the battlefield where the doctors would recognize that there were so many people with wounds that they could not save everyone. And they'd make decisions. They'd group people into three groups. The group that was unlikely to be saved, no matter how much resources you invested into them. And they, those were the people who would require a tremendous amount of resources, but very unlikely that they could be saved. Those people would be set aside and then the rest were grouped by who has more, most urgent needs and who could wait a bit longer. So by setting aside those who would require a tremendous amount of resources and not likely to survive, you're able to save more people. So if you have one ventilator and two people who need it, you could have one option where the ventilator is given to the most urgent ill, the sickest person who's not likely to survive anyway, and the next person who's likely to survive if they got a ventilator but will die without one. And you can have the situation in which they both die because you've given the ventilator to the person who would die anyway and deprive the person of the ventilator who could have been saved. So is two deaths better than saving one life? And if you think about your loved one having a chance to live, which policy would you accept? It's that avoid the worst outcome, which is avoiding two deaths when you could actually save one. And another way of saying it is avoid the most avoidable deaths. So it's important to notice that the idea of save the most lives or save the most life years is not what triage is about. If you're saving the most life years or the most lives, you have to look at all of the people who need resources and prioritize those who have the best chance of living or the best chance of living for a long time. That means you're going to prioritize the people who are a little bit sick and you could surely save them, or the people who are relatively young and they would live a longer amount of time. So triage is a different principle from save the most lives or save the most life years. It's avoid the worst outcome. So why is triage a right policy for allocating scarce resources and the clinical situation. It minimizes everyone's chance of dying. It gives everyone a better chance of living than could be had by a different principle. And it's the principle that people could not reasonably reject for governing scarce clinical resources during extreme scarcity. Um, Rawls would call it maximin. So how is it implemented in a clinical setting during the pandemic? What we did at Mount Sinai was we identified, we developed this policy, which was to identify those who are least likely to survive regardless of treatment. And they actually had formulas from critical care uh, to predict how likely it is for somebody to survive. And that's how they 
decided someone was least likely to survive. And then they created exclusion criteria based on those formulas. And our benchmark was surviving outside of the acute care setting. So will this patient be able to survive to discharge? Other hospitals used, would this patient be able to survive for one month or six months or a year outside of the hospital? We use this very minimal standard of survive outside of the hospital. And our second criteria was, will this patient be able to perceive the benefits of treatment? So if you have someone in a vegetative state, a persistent vegetative state, they're not going to be able to perceive the benefits. And we withheld scarce critical resources from those who met criteria one and or two and provided scarce life preserving resources as a trial of care for other people. And our idea was to reevaluate patients who had access to these critically scarce resources every two days to determine if they were still eligible. We weren't giving them the gift of these resources to be theirs forever, but so theirs for so long as they could have a chance of surviving to discharge. Now, these, this was our policy at Mount Sinai. Fortunately, we never had to implement it. Now, when there are not enough resources to provide medically reasonable clinical management to all patients, those not treated will certainly get worse and some will die. And society trusts the profession to adhere with rigorous triage judgments based on objective criteria applied equally to all. Now, I'm going to digress for a moment to back to 2004, when in the United States we had a flu vaccine shortage. I, I'm giving you this example as a frame of reference. So... At that point, our government was very slow to adopt a national policy. So every community around the country developed their own policy and the policies were very, very similar. They limited the sh short supply to the immunocompromised, the very young pregnant women, the elderly and healthcare providers. So the principle was, they were using was avoid the worst outcome, avoid two deaths when you could save one. So everybody agreed that was a terrific policy. We'd say there was an overlap in consensus that that was the way to proceed. Now, how should justice be implemented in a public as a public health measure now during COVID? So we have the vaccine and it's produced a little at a time. And at any time, there's not enough for everybody, particularly at the beginning. So we start according to what Aristotle taught us by gathering the facts. So SARS-CoV-2 is a new coronavirus emerging late in 2019. It quickly spread around the world, killing a lot of humans and it's an airborne, highly contagious, deadly disease. And we also know that viruses reproduce rapidly and they mutate rapidly. Now, the advice we got from our experts were that until we contain the SARS-CoV-2 virus, we cannot provide social benefits. And without stopping the spread, we will not reduce COVID-related morbidity and mortality and vaccination will significantly reduce likelihood of contracting and spreading the disease. So with those facts as background, what should be the goal for vaccination policies? Which principles should guide us um, and which principles should we set aside? So let me give you some more facts. I put this slide together at the end of April and this was the picture in the United States at that point. Um, we had several peaks in uh, the disease. And by the end of April, we had still about 60,000 cases a day, new cases a day. 
which was still quite a lot. And this is some data from the CDC website from March when I collected it. And it tells you about different populations in the United States. So the population over 65 who had at least one dose of the vaccine amounted to about 60% of the population. Well, the population of 64, 18 to 64 accounted to only 24% of the vaccines. Now I put the numbers from the CDC together and the people in the group 65 and old, older, only 14.3 of them, this was based on data from March, only 14.3 of them had been infected. But by March, 60% of them had gotten the first dose. And if you look at the people 18 to 64, 75% of them had been infected and only 24% of them had gotten the first dose. Now you'll notice that I call these groups victims and vectors. So the victims are the people that our policies around the world have been focused on, the people who are most likely to die if they get disease. And the vectors are the people who are most likely, if they get infected, to transmit the disease. And while they're infected, remember that the va vaccine, I'm sorry, the disease, the virus is mutating. So that's why our experts had told us we have to contain the disease. Now, going back to thinking about the flu vaccine shortage in 2004 and thinking about it in comparison to the vaccine shortage situation, these are very different situations. So in 2004, we knew a lot about expected flu vaccine, flu mortality in the US. Um, this was 2019, there were about 61,000 deaths. That's about typical, but we've had 573,000 deaths, almost 600,000 deaths now in the US from COVID-19. Flu typically runs its course by spring, COVID, we expected to run its course, but it didn't. It diminished somewhat, but it didn't disappear. We knew how to treat the flu very well in 2004. In 2021, we still had no effective treatments for COVID. And in 2004, we didn't expect to, our hospitals to be overwhelmed. We expected that if people got the flu because they didn't get the vaccine, we could take care of them all. But in 2021, when the vaccine became available, we knew that our facilities were getting overwhelmed with patients who needed treatment for COVID. So should, the, should we have followed in 2019 the same allocation plan as was followed in 2019? in 2004. Now, just this March, March 26th, an article appeared in, in the journal Science. And in this article, it wasn't focused on my issue of who should get the COVID vaccine. They were focused on um, whether sending children back to school actually increased COVID infections. But the data in that article was very interesting. So if you look at these bars, the black outline bars show the percent of the population. And the blue bars show where the infections came from, the sources of infections. In other words, the blue bars showed you where the vectors of the disease are. And you can see very dramatically that the people over 80, there were almost no vectors of the disease. In the group 65 to 79, 
There were a few. So combined 65 and over, it's less than 3% of the cases of COVID were caused by being infected in some by someone over 65. The only two groups that exceed their proportion of the population in spreading the disease are the people aged 20 to 64. Um, 20 to 49 exceed, and altogether, if you combine the groups from 20 to 64, it comes out to about 73% of cases are their responsibility. They've spread those diseases. So, Sorry, my way please, can you come to uh, your conclusion? Uh, uh, two, three minutes again, please. That's it, I'll do it. So if you ask how should justice be implemented as a public health measure, not in the hospital, as a public health measure, I think we have to identify those most likely to spread the disease, the vectors, identify those least likely to spread the disease, those 65 and older, identify the harms caused by the disease. And the policymakers, they took death very seriously, but it, they ignored other harms that are consequent to being infected. So the harmful impact on the young. We've heard in the US about multi-system inflammatory disease in children. Depression and suicide are very high among young people. They've also had harmful and enduring impacts on their socialization and their education. And then there are the people who actually get infected and they are the, what we call the long haulers because some of them have enduring consequences of having had this disease. And we don't know if those enduring consequences will fade, remain, or increase over life. So we have to compare the harms and burdens. So some people, people like me, I was able to work at home and not so bad. It's Pretty nice being at home with my husband, sharing breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So all of these things taken together, here's my novel proposal for how vaccine should be allocated in a pandemic like what we're living through right now. I think the first group should include essential workers, anyone who's required to work outside the house, from sanitation workers to food preparation people, to grocery stores, to police, firemen, and healthcare workers. Among them, I think the healthcare workers should go first, not because of reciprocity, but because they are in short supply given the extraordinary needs caused by COVID. So all of them should be the first group. And the second group are those who could isolate in their homes, they don't have to work outside of their residences. Those are the non-essential workers. And that includes, I would put first, the children and youth under the age of 20 for whom vaccination is safe and effective. Then people from 20 to 64. And last of all, the people age over 64. I'm one of these last. So thank you very much for your attention and I will stop sharing my slides. Thank you, Rosamond, for your rich presentation. Uh, many Thank questions you. and issues uh, have been put on the table that are uh, worth discussion and uh, a deeper insight. Uh, we'll come back to them during our discussion. Uh, Joe, uh, the floor is yours please 20 25 minutes all right well thank you very much i'd first like to thank the bruno kessler foundation and to professor lucia galvani for the kind invitation i'd like to thank professor rhodes for a really wonderful presentation and thoughtful presentation i'd like to thank uh professor uh sam Plici for chairing the, the session and also to Jenny Schiff for the discussant uh, role a little bit later and to all of you for participating today. Um, my name is Joseph Rejo and I'm at UCLA Health and I'm going to talk 
a little bit about developing an ethically defensible hospital triage policy. So a more micro focus. Um, as a clinical ethicist at the UCLA Ethics Center, my colleagues and I were involved in the development of a hospital policy to address the allocation of scarce critical care resources during a pandemic. Uh, for this talk, I've been asked by um, Lucia to de describe the triage policy itself, how it was designed in its ethical rationale and underpinnings, and the policy's overall relevance. My reflections are my own and do not necessarily reflect the official views of my institution. My point of departure begins in early March of last year when the Italian Society for Anesthesia, Analgesia, Resuscitation and Intensive Care published the world's first COVID triage protocol, the CRT guidelines. The document advanced the view that scarce intensive care resources, such as ventilators, should be allocated to patients who have a greater likelihood of surviving and who secondarily have more years of life saved with a view to maximizing the benefits for the greatest number of people. These guidelines were widely discussed. People asked whether it was fair to allocate resources to patients who have a greater likelihood of survival or to patients who will have more years of life saved. Some commentators criticized the document for suggesting that life-saving resources be rationed on the basis of age. Is age an ethically unacceptable um, criterion for triage? If it is, what alternative criterion or criteria ought to guide these decisions? Attempting to skirt the issue entirely by having no unified plan will not do. Relying on our standard approaches to ICU admission is also unsatisfactory. For instance, first come, first served. The conditions of scarcity are such that triage decisions inevitably will be made. If guidelines are not articulated explicitly, decisions will be made implicitly idiosyncratically and on an ad hoc basis by clinicians at the bedside. Patients who have similar clinical needs and identical prognoses would be treated differently. Thus, if we wish to avoid distributing critical care resources in an unprincipled, unsystematic way that is also prone to individual bias, we need to identify criteria for their fair allocation. This takes us to the question of justice. At the risk of gross oversimplification, justice is about rendering to each his due. Distributive justice, which we are discussing today, concerns the fair distribution of available goods and services, such as extremely limited ICU resources during a pandemic surge. Justice demands that we are consistent in approach, treating patients according to the same standard. Justice also requires that we do not base decisions on morally irrelevant features, such as the patient's race, ability to pay, immigration status, VIP status, and religion, among others. Which criteria then are morally relevant? Imagine that there are 10 patients in need of intensive care, but there's only one remaining ICU bed. How should we decide who gets this last bed? What is the ethical basis, do you think, for that decision? Some possibilities in the literature include the following. First, exclu focus exclusively on likelihood of benefit with intervention. One could also break this down further into short and long-term benefit. Secondly, prioritize the patient who will use the least amount of ICU resources, thus freeing up other machines and resources to save more lives. Third, select the patient who will have the most life years saved if provided treatment. 
One might also consider not just benefit with treatment, but also quality of treatment. And therefore, we ought to allocate based on the anticipated quality of life of the patient. Perhaps, however, priority should go to persons who perform vital functions like essential healthcare workers. This would not be based on intrinsic worth, but on reciprocity for their instrumental value in saving others' lives. Healthcare workers are putting their lives at risk daily by treating highly infectious patients. Moreover, nurses, physicians, respiratory therapists are generally hard to replace. A final principle that one could, could consider is random allocation, such as a lottery. As many have pointed out, and Professor Rhodes pointed this out uh, just a little while ago, no one criterion on its own is usually sufficient for a triage policy. In fact, my institution's policy makes use of multiple criteria. Let me move now to briefly discuss our policy. Our ethics center had been requested by hospital leadership to review existing allocation guidelines and make recommendations. We undertook an extensive literature review and debated amongst ourselves how a triage policy should be devised. Our group participated also in several meetings with our hospital colleagues in critical care and infectious disease. A two-pronged approach was delineated. Ethics faculty and staff worked to establish defensible moral criteria to guide triage decisions. The resulting document would then interface with a specific organizational protocol that was being developed by our physicians. This latter document would be used to assess and rank patients based on their baseline health condition, current illness severity, and likelihood of survival of critical illness if provided ICU resources. Patients would receive an allocation score and be assigned to a triage category. Following the literature review, our center drafted an updated document, which was circulated to our two hospital ethics committees, which included both clinical and community members. Our initial ethics allocation guideline received approval from the hospital's command center in late March of last year. We continued discussions through late August, however, sometimes on a weekly basis. Our document eventually was updated in September to reflect additional developments that had occurred, had occurred in the interim. Before I speak about the principles for allocation, I have some preliminary comments that will frame our approach. First, although the principles of triage differ significantly from the principles that ordinarily guide the provision of clinical care, the principles we ultimately settled upon, we would argue, enjoy broad professional acceptance and are consistent with the fundamental moral commitments of healthcare professionals. Secondly, the triage principles apply only in the event of crisis circumstances. Third, these principles apply to all patients who require ICU resources, not just COVID patients. Finally, a policy may decide whether or not to have exclusion criteria. Our group argued that in general, there should be no automatic exclusion of patients from a triage policy. That is every patient who potentially could benefit from ICU resources should be included in the triage pool. I will say parenthetically that our institution also has a futility policy uh, and that would function as an exclusion criterion, but I will table that for the moment and I'm happy to discuss during question and answer. In terms of its structure, our allocation guidance document stipulates an overall goal of triage followed by specific ethical principles and then due process considerations. During a pandemic, the overall goal of triage will generally be one that aims to save as many lives as possible. This is a broad public health ethic. Our policy states that the overall goal is to maximize the number of patients who will survive the crisis. To be more specific, 
The goal is to maximize the number of patients who will survive to hospital discharge if provided critical care resources. This goal acts as our first ethical criterion. Provided a patient is judged to survive to hospital discharge, he or she is included in the triage pool. By contrast, because we don't have automatic exclusions, if a patient is determined to have a very low probability of survival to discharge, he or she will be triaged to the lowest level of priority. One might argue that this is a very limited first criterion, and it is. Part of the reason why we nevertheless settled on it is that our critical care physicians argued that it was just too difficult to accurately prognosticate much beyond hospital discharge. In the face of considerable uncertainty, it is best ethics practice to err on the side of caution. Now, if this first criterion, survival to hospital discharge, becomes insufficient to determine priority access, we move to the next two ethical criteria. These are likelihood of survival and short-term life expectancy. The first deals with patients who are significantly more likely to survive to discharge. In that case, those patients should be assigned a higher priority than patients who are significantly less likely to survive. This principle aims to ensure that we allocate resources to those who have a better overall chance of surviving. The second, short-term life expectancy. Patients with a terminal illness or a life expectancy of six months or less should be assigned a lower priority than patients with a life expectancy of more than six months. This principle aims to ensure that we do not allocate resources to patients who are expected to die within a relatively short period of time, regardless of whether treatment is provided. Finally, if these three criteria proved insufficient to determine who should receive ICU resources, our group settled that the fairest approach would be to move to random allocation, that is, to make decisions based on a lottery. We had actually also debated a number of other criteria, but those criteria were considered rather controversial and therefore they were excluded as um, possible criteria. Our groups also debated whether particular patients or groups should be given priority to, to critical care. This has been controversial in the literature um, and it was controversial amongst us. As we pointed out, any priority access would have to be consistent with the overall ethical triage goal. Our committees settled on the following groups to be prioritized, provided that they were not excluded by the former criteria. First, frontline healthcare workers and administrators, if their work will significantly affect the extent to which the greatest number of persons possible shall survive the crisis. And secondly, it is reasonably anticipated that as a result of treatment, they will become available to discharge their professional responsibilities. Secondly, um, pregnant patients were believed uh, that they required priority access when two lives could be saved. Thirdly, immediate post-operative surgical patients. The basic reason here is that they're, um, they're probably at high risk of death once they're initially out of surgery, but once they get over that initial hump following surgery, they will have a very good long-term prognosis. Finally, transplant patients. Um, when there's an active transplant offer or the transplant patient has just received uh, a scarce organ. Let me move now to due process. Our policy has articulated uh, its overall goal, its principles of allocation and priority groups. We can now address due process. Our policy states the following. The evaluation of whether a particular patient meets triage criteria should be made by a triage team, not by the clinical care team. This helps protect against bias, reduces moral distress, and burnout. 
Secondly, to the greatest extent possible, patient information should be blinded to the triage officer. The guidelines should be made known to hospital staff, patients, their families, and legal decision makers. Next, there should be a fair appeals mechanism for those patients who have been denied treatment. Appeals should only be allowed with respect to procedural or technical errors. Finally, there should be an additional mechanism for retrospective review of triage decisions. We recommended that this process should include community representation. Now to just briefly conclude, thankfully our hospital never had to implement the triage policy. We came very close in December as well as uh, January and February of this year when available ICU beds in the County of Los Angeles were extremely scarce. However, our hospital engaged in significant medical surge planning. So elective surgeries were postponed, operating room spaces were transformed into temporary ICUs. The capacity of our two hospitals, six ICUs was expanded further. And to give you an example, our pediatric intensive care unit um, uh, carved out space to care also for adult patients. Think, um, excuse me, the benefits of a guideline or policy I think are multiple. Whether or not a policy exists, conditions of scarcity are such that triage decisions will inevitably need to be made. An explicit policy avoids idiosyncratic and ad hoc decision making by the physician at the bedside. It promotes transparency about how decisions are made and the ethical rationale for the decisions can be scrutinized. This doesn't mean that triage policies will necessarily be ethically defensible, but it does mean that these decisions can be vetted prior to being implemented. This is what we tried to do at UCLA. Finally, thinking toward the future, I think it's important that we have public stakeholders weigh in on a triage policy. This would be similar to what had occurred some years ago in the state of Maryland. Um, so I'd like to thank you very much. Uh, and I look forward to the question and answer session. Thank you very much, uh, Joe. Uh, now our discussant, Jenny, the floor is yours. Please 10 minutes, if possible. Okay. Yes. Um, I will not be sharing the screen. Okay, so first, thank you to the Fondazione Bruno Kessler for inviting me to participate in this event, uh, with particular thanks to Chia Galvani and Monica Consolandi, and thank you also to both our speakers, Rosamund Rhodes and Joseph Rajo, and to our chair, Stefano Semplici. So both Dr. Rhodes and Dr. Rajo's presentations focus on issues of justice and equity in the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly related to allocation of scarce resources. Dr. Rhodes first explores justice in medical triage in the clinical setting, and then more specifically in the development of COVID-19 vaccine prioritization lists. Ultimately, she proposes a new vaccination scheme that after essential workers prioritizes younger populations. Dr. Rhodes explains that several principles of justice have a leg legitimate place in resource allocation. She emphasizes the strategy of focusing in on a specific practical problem and identifying a principle or principles that will address relevant concerns. She asks us to think about which principles of justice are appropriate to consider in the allocation of medical resources. She emphasizes that we must carefully consider which factors are relevant for our moral triage decisions and which must not influence these decisions. She explains, like Dr. Rajo, that it is difficult to achieve justice in medical and public health policy since there is no single perfect governing principle or formula for success. Rather, there are a variety of considerations that can and do support a good policy. She tells us that allocation policies must reflect choices people cannot reasonably reject and must reflect the priorities that informed reasonable people can recognize as the most pressing concerns in whatever particular situation we're analyzing. In the case of allocating scarce life-saving resources in clinical medicine, 
Dr. Rhodes explains why triage is the right policy. It minimizes everyone's chance of dying and gives everyone a better chance of living than could be had by use of another scheme. It's also the principle, she says, that people could not reasonably reject. Dr. Rose explains that society's trust in the medical profession requires adherence with rigorous triage judgments based on criteria applied equally to all patients. She then uses her preliminary analysis to discuss the specific case of COVID-19 vaccine prioritization systems. That is when it is necessary to decide at times when there is a limited supply of vaccine the order of who in the population is eligible to receive it first. This is a public health issue. In order to determine which principles of justice apply to the case of vaccine distribution, she first examines critical information and data about COVID-19 disease and COVID-19 vaccines, particularly involving different age groups. She notes that while significantly more people in the 65 plus age group have died from the disease, Younger populations make up a much larger proportion of infected people and therefore have an increased likelihood of being vectors of transmission. In proposing a novel COVID-19 prioritization scheme for vaccines, Dr. Rhodes asks us to think about what the goal of the policy should be and calls on us to consider how justice should be implemented. She says we must identify those who are most likely and least likely to spread the disease. We must also consider a variety of harms caused by COVID-19 in addition to death. For example, as she explains, young people have suffered tremendously. Some have developed multi-system inflammatory syndrome. There is an increase in depression and suicide rates in young populations, and they have also been seriously affected socially and in their education. She also considers the long-term effects of the virus on people who have never even been hospitalized so-called long haulers. These people have been suffering debilitating symptoms of long COVID for months, some more than a year after initial infection. She therefore proposes a new prioritization scheme. First, essential workers, those required to interact with others outside the home, and then non-essential workers, those who can isolate at home, that is who are less likely to spread the disease. Within this second group, she prioritizes younger populations those under 20 for whom the vaccine is safe, then 20 to 64, and finally 65 plus. In this way, Dr. Rhodes's policy takes the opposite approach of many countries who have been prioritizing older populations who are more vulnerable to death and hospitalization, and then move on to younger age groups once more vaccine is available. Dr. Rajo explains how he and his colleagues at UCLA Health developed a hospital policy to address the allocation of scarce critical care resources during a pandemic surge. In his presentation, he describes the policy and how it was designed, its ethical rationale and its relevance. Although, as he explains, it was never actually utilized or had to be utilized, ultimately the institution is in a better position for future crises since the policy is not specific to pandemics. It can be applied to any public health crisis. Upon reflecting on the Italian Society for Anesthesia, Analgesia, Resuscitation, and Intensive Care Guidelines, or CIARTI, Dr. Rajo asks us to consider whether allocating scarce intensive care resources by determining who has a greater likelihood of surviving or who will have more years of life, life saved is fair. Should we be considering the quality of the patient's survival, he asks. Is age an ethically acceptable criterion for triage? Dr. Rajo emphasizes that we need a unified plan for medical triage for scarce ICU resources. We cannot rely on first come first serve system. Like Dr. Rhodes, Dr. Rajo says that carefully articulated criteria must be applied rigorously, systematically, and equally to all patients. This way the effects of bias can be reduced. We cannot provide an ICU bed and ventilators to those with no chance of survival, but we also cannot provide them to everyone who could benefit since during a surge, there would not be enough of these resources. The question becomes, what is the fairest way to allocate ICU resources when demand is much higher than supply? Dr. Rajo talks about the need for his hospital to review its existing allocation policy for a public health disaster and then make any necessary adjustments.
the policy he and his colleagues worked on has as its overall goal the maximization of the number of patients who will survive to hospital discharge if provided critical care resources. This is the first ethical criterion. If this is insufficient to determine priority access, the next two ethical criteria are likelihood of survival and short-term life expectancy. He then explains that if even these are not sufficient to determine priority access, a lottery would be used. Dr. Raha has detailed the priority groups for UCLA's policy as well, namely frontline healthcare workers and administrators, pregnant patients, immediate post-op surgical patients, and transplant patients. That is, if all of these are not excluded by former criteria. He goes on to explain various due process considerations. For example, an important element of the policy is that a separate team of people from the clinical team makes triage decisions. Triage decisions. This way, decisions are protected against bias, at least as best as possible. Patient information is also blinded to the triage officer. I found it extremely important that there were accountability measures incorporated, such as mechanisms for a retrospective review of triage decisions, ideally involving community representation. Overall, Dr. Raho elucidates the need for a transparent, systematic triage policy whose ethical rationale can be scrutinized. He says this will ultimately provide institutional support to healthcare workers and reduce moral distress and burnout. Both Dr. Rose and Dr. Raho have presented on themes we have thought very deeply about during the COVID-19 pandemic. I would like to close by offering some questions for further discussion that I hope can help us transition well to the question and answer period. So first, themes of age, risk of death, and long-term disability or illness come up in both speakers' presentations. My first question is what role should age play in a vaccine prioritization list for COVID-19, particularly at a time when there is community spread? What about in a triage policy for scarce ICU resources, if at all? So it's, it's our understanding that there was lots of debate in Italy regarding this point related to age. And I'm also wondering, in developing a vaccine prioritization scheme, how we should weigh the risk of death from COVID-19 against the risk of long-term effects and disability from the virus, or so-called long COVID that Dr. Rhodes explains. Next, picking up on Dr. Raho's presentation, I wonder about the possible need for a uniform triage policy of ICU resources across regions and institutions. Is it a problem if people show up to one hospital whose criteria may be rather different from another's? Are there advantages to having different policies? And finally, at this stage of the pandemic, what do you see as some of the core ethical issues involving justice and COVID-19 that we are grappling with as a population? Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jenny, uh, also for keeping the time. And uh, I think that we have time enough to collect uh, a couple of, of questions. Uh, if any, uh, I would like to, to invite those uh, uh, who want to have the floor to raise their hand. Otherwise, we can uh, start giving the floor again to the two speakers uh, and then waiting for some questions from the audience. Any question from the audience? So, Rosamond and Joe, uh, you have the floor to to answer the questions raised by by Jenny. Rosamond. Okay, age was Jenny's first question, um, and I think age, when it comes to vaccine distribution, turns out to be an important consideration because people the aged are more likely to be able to isolate at home uh, and on the one hand that makes them less likely to be vectors of disease and if they should get the disease and be left with complications they'll be shorter lasting because life expectancy is shorter. So there, I think it's relevant. 
when it comes to allocating ICU beds, I think it's not relevant because um, people who are can be 80 years old and can be athletes and healthy, have no underlying condition, and you can foresee very well that they might do very well if infected. So I think you have to, in the clinical setting, take a very case-specific view. Uh, so that's age. Should I go on or, Joseph, do you want to say something about age? Sure, thanks. I'll be very quick, Dr. Rhodes. I think that age uh, in certain circumstances can be an ethically defensible um, element of a criterion, but only to the extent, and this is what I would say, only to the extent that it affects the possibility of benefit or survival for the patient. So age considered by itself ought not to be part of a triage policy. It should only be factored, and I think it is, to the extent that it affects illness severity and comorbidities. And I'll, like I'll turn it back to, to Dr. Rhodes. I'd like to respond to Jenny's question about how do you compare risks of death to risks of long COVID kind of things. And I think that's a really interesting and important question. So if you are comparing, I don't know, five pounds of potatoes to five pounds of onions. You can put them on the same scale and say they weigh the same amount. When we're talking about things like the risk of death compared to the risk of living with impaired brain function, we're talking about incommensurable things. They don't go on the same scale. So I think, again, you need what Aristotle talked about, he called it practical wisdom, I've called it moral discernment, to, to think about how bad these two things are. And certainly nobody wants death. But there are people who say life in this condition for me is not worth living. So people make this judgment that some complications are worse than death. And in setting up these decisions, these will come up in clinical situations, and it's going to be very, very difficult, and that's what we want to avoid. So I think the way we go about these decisions is focusing on the particular issue in front of us. It, in doing clinical ethics in the hospital, we're focusing on one patient at a time. And in making, for example, transplant allocation decisions. We're focusing on one patient at a time, but then we also have policies. And among those policies, I think in transplantation and in um, critical care, we do make these kind of triage decisions. I know in the transplant program, people are listed and we know, we know and they know and their family members know if they should develop sepsis, blood infection. They're either made inactive on the list or taken off the list, even if it means they're likely to die sooner by not getting a transplant organ. And in our hospital, at least, we make triage decisions on who gets into the ICU. So if there is somebody very disabled, I guess Dr. Roja would call it a futility decision. We don't make the futility decisions, but we'll say that the ICU is reserved for people who have a significant likelihood of benefiting from the bed in the ICU. So there are, at least in critical care, transpl organ transplantation, and circumstances like vaccine scarcity, we make triage decisions and we have to set policies to guide the treatment of everyone by the same policy. So even though these are incommensurable things that we're weighing, I think it, one important consideration is that somebody, the 80-year-old, the 99-year-old, 
whatever consequences they have, they're not likely to live very long. There was on the news just the other day, a man in Australia has all of his mental capacities and he's 115. Those are rare cases. For the most part, as you get over 80, you're going to have disabilities of different sorts. And I think that something like pain, many of us have accepted surgery. So pain that's going to last for a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months, not so bad, but pain for the rest of your life is worse. Lost of some abilities for a short period of time. I don't know if you have to wear a cast for a short period of time. It's annoying, but it's not so terrible. You know, it has a limited duration. So I think when you get down to those kinds of considerations and critical care, uh, I think the duration of the the unfortunate consequence has to be taken into account. Joe? Yes, yeah, so just to answer um, Jenny's question about a uniform policy, what is interesting that um, we did in our state was the University of California University system, which is one of the largest in the state. It's uh, it includes 10 universities, six of which are medical uh, universities as well. So our policy was a uniform policy among the six, the five other medical campuses in California. So in a sense, we have a uniform policy and we also received guidance at the state level um, that should help inform the triage policies throughout the state. I will say that that guidance came in June. And so when we were initially creating our policy, we didn't have guidance from the state or from the office of the president at our university. So we were kind of going on our own and trying to find the most ethically defensible approach. Um, I will say um, to, to Dr. Rhodes' point about patients who might not uh, want prolonged ICU treatment, um, perhaps due to pain, due to functional impairment. Uh, part, I did not mention earlier, but part of our policy would try to elicit the patient's goals of care prior to getting to the triage decision. So if a patient would absolutely not want such resources, we have a responsibility to respect that autonomous decision and um, provide only palliative care or whatever is consistent with their overarching goals of care. So, if, uh, if I may. Lucia. Yes, I, I, I maybe I go back to, um, like to say, um, some evaluations about uh, the justice criterion, uh, the equity criterion, and some main conditions that the pandemics and the outbreak caused. So the first question, these are, like to say, doubts I still have, uh, regards the fact that we, we are applying a criterion, a, a justice criterion, on a scenario that is highly uncertain. And so, I mean, all the uncertainties that the outbreak uh, brought with itself, uh, um, had an impact, I think uh, I, I, all of us uh, could understand how difficult it was also to, pre to imagine or to make a calculation about probabilities of survival of some patients because uh, the disease and the symptoms it caused were not so predictable, were not uh, already well known and so it could imply to do um, uh, I like to say to to calculate a probability, but with very uncertain conditions and knowledge, I think. And so I am wondering about how much this may this big uncertainty, medical and clinical uncertainty, could also be included when we think or try to apply equity and justice criteria. And the second passage is not. Uh, 
um, regards more something that is a cultural contribution. So I am wondering if, uh, if there is a specific contribution that uh, different religion can bring uh, to the concept of equity and justice, because we tend uh, uh, to go back to philosophy, but I am wondering if there is something that uh, it, it could be brought uh, or, uh, by, by religions on, on this specific matter of equity. What does it mean to take care uh, in, in, in a situation where we cannot guarantee all to all, but uh, so we, we need to take care of everyone. So thank you. Rosamund and Joe on these two points made by Lucia. Okay, on the uncertainty issue, I think the big uncertainty has to do with the variants of the COVID virus. So we, we know that viruses mutate rapidly and we know that it can change in all kinds of direction. It could become more benign, but it could also become more virulent. We could, it could become less transmissible, but it could become more transmissible. And what we've seen in the months since vaccine has become available is that these more transmissible viruses have become more dominant because they're more transmissible. And they've led to surges in places like Brazil and India. So I think what the experts told us at the beginning was that containment should be our first priority has turned out to be the most important consideration. And even though the experts had said, you can't get any of the benefits you want, like saving lives or opening up society until you contain the viruses, the policies have gone in a completely different direction. Um, now, one of the things Joseph said uh, that m makes me very uncomfortable, that was the idea that you have to have an amalgam of, of policies. And a number of the authors who have written about uh, vaccination prioritization, the groups with Emmanuel and the groups from Johns Hopkins and um, Nancy Jecker and on and on and on. They're all recommending put together all your favorite policies. And But the point is, and it was recognized by everybody, almost everybody, that in the clinical setting, we focused on one policy, mm -hmm. one principle, triage. Now, if that was the right way to go, and what should be interesting to you, here we have the view from Mount Sinai. We have our group made policy for seven hospitals. So it was an interdisciplinary team making policy for seven hospitals and very much similar frameworks. You get smart people thinking about the same practical problem. You get the same answer. What Rawls would call an overlap and consensus of reasonable and rational people. They come out exactly the same. In 2004, exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Now, with the COVID vaccine allocation, around the world, you come out with exactly the same response. And I think it's completely wrongheaded. And a lot of individuals thinking this through themselves said, why am I getting the vaccine? And why not somebody who's going to work? And I think we get that mistaken answer because uh, philosophers were focusing on principles and they were talking about principles. And the, the policy makers, what they had learned from philosophers was a priority for the worst off. And they presumed that they already knew how to handle it from 2004. And they did not pay attention to the facts that 2021 was radically different from 2004. And that terrific principle that's really important when we talk about Black Lives Matter and um, other social problems are irrelevant for this decision. And if you think about the long range consequences, 
the people in America who are the black and brown people who are working a lot in the jobs in the street who would be most vulnerable, they benefit the most from giving priority to the vectors of disease. So I think, well, in the clinical situation, we had really careful thought. And in the 2004 flu vaccine situation, we had careful thought. I think it went haywire into stupidity in 2021 vaccine allocation. Joe? Yes, I'm just gonna focus my comments on the first question that Lucia had about how do we address the criterion for triage amidst profound medical uncertainty? And I would like to say to the group that this consideration weighed very heavily on our clinical colleagues. They felt that some of the, the ethical criteria that are advocated in the ethics literature, for instance, to maximize overall life years or to focus on life cycle considerations, these clinicians felt that it was virtually impossible to forecast long-term what patients' prognoses would be. And for that reason, in the face of considerable uncertainty, we need to focus on what it is that doctors and our infectious disease experts can adequately forecast. And therefore, that's why we, we chose or opted for a criterion that's very targeted, limited, but quantifiable. Um, and so it, it sought to recognize who among all of these patients might benefit if given um, a scarce life-saving resource. Um, so in the face of uncertainty, Lucia, I would say we have to default to the, the safest um, approach and not overextend our criteria. Um, I will not respond to the second of your question because I'm I'm not an expert in religious tradition. So I will leave that to perhaps others, either Dr. Rhodes or other folks in the audience who might be able to comment. Um, so I, I don't see any hands on, uh, nor uh, requests uh, in the chat. So uh, may Joe, may uh, I ask a very direct question? Uh, to you, uh, take the example of two very similar uh, situations as to clinical evaluation. Uh, roughly the same uh, probability of surviving to discharge, uh, roughly the same likelihood of survival uh, in uh, the short term. Uh, you made uh, a threshold, the six months uh, uh, threshold. So that said, uh, a guy of 20 years old, a guy who is 20 years old uh, uh, and uh, 80, uh, 80 and 20, you come to a lottery. You said that or not? Great question, Professor Samplici. And um, th this certainly is a scenario that we thought about. Um, and I'm going to say we, we opted for a lottery at that point. So if, as you say, both patients, the 80 year old and the 20 year old have an equally good chance or probability of surviving to hospital discharge, they both have a, a high probability of that occurring and, uh, a favorable short-term prognosis. Um, at that point, we um, would advocate for a lottery. Let me say that does seem unfair in a sense, right? Because I'm sure some individuals on this call think that perhaps the resources ought to go to the younger individual, primarily because that younger person has not had an opportunity, which the 80-year-old had, to live through the most important phases of human life, right? Um, so life cycle considerations. Um, a reigning saga. Excuse me? 
fair innings argument life uh, and so on mm -hmm. we 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 considered initially life cycle arguments or most years of life saved for instance but again to go back to the prognosis issue it's very hard to forecast beyond the six months as our clinician colleague said but secondly life cycle considerations or overall years of life saved we felt was was a criterion that was quite controversial and it certainly was not endorsed at least in california at the time as it had been endorsed i believe in the state of maryland um, and so before implementing a criterion that is so consequential and so controversial, we felt that we needed further public stakeholder involvement, which we did not have uh, during the pandemic so far. Okay. So that's the reason why we did not opt for that type of criterion, although we extensively debated it. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Lucia, I, I don't see any hands on, uh, no request uh, uh, in the chat. So I, I think that we can come to the conclusion of our lively, so interesting debate. Yes. Uh, anything okay. else? So uh, I'm Is happy someone... to leave you the floor for the conclusion. Let me say uh, thank you again for uh, inviting me and for giving all of us the opportunity to take part in this so interesting uh, debate. I think that many interesting and not obvious points uh, uh, were made. Uh, take the example uh, of uh, uh, Rosamond's argument uh, about uh, prioritization criteria in the case of vaccination. Maybe uh, something to focus on is exactly this relationship between the issue of allocation of resources uh, in the case uh, of ICU beds uh, and, uh, and uh, vaccination. Uh, there are similarities uh, as well as differences, and, and I think this was a, a useful opportunity to start reflecting on, uh, on that uh, uh, as well. Uh, so uh, thank you to our speakers. Uh, thank you to uh, our discussant, Jenny. And uh, Lucia, the floor is yours for the conclusion. Okay. Many thanks to, to all, to everyone. Uh, I think there, there would be a lot uh, to discuss uh, at this point because we just opened uh, uh, a main debate that I think uh, will last uh, for, for a while. I hope not uh, uh, to because of the situation of the outbreak and of the contagion, but uh, because of the issue that he, it moved, like to say, it's, uh, it is clearly a, a, a time when we needed also to start thinking what we have done and reflect and see if we can find something more uh, behind what has already been done with a lot of uh, effort and uh, and um, attention to, to the people involved and to the people concerned. So I wish to thank you so much for, for coming today. So thank, many thanks to Rosamond, to Joseph, uh, Jenny and Stefano, to the participants. Uh, the, this webinar series will go on for uh, around the two more months so if uh, every one of you wish to join us the next episode will be on june 3rd and it will regard the contribution of global faith-based healthcare organization in the covid 19 emergency um, i think today anyway we we have discussed and approached one of the most uh, uh, complex and uh, relevant issue we faced and we are facing uh, in this uh, emergency. So thank you, uh, thank you all for the contribution, but also for the work that you have done during the past month to to contain uh, the the harm and to answer to some main. Uh, um, needs of uh, healthcare workers and of all uh, the population who needs uh, care that means all of us so thank you so much and take care bye bye, bye, -bye.